Coming up today on the show, Jackson Bevins, writer of the Cigar Thoughts column for many years, host of the Cigar Thoughts podcast. And for those of you who had followed him and read him for years, for over a decade, as I have, you've only read his thoughts about a Pete Carroll-led Seattle Seahawks organization. Well, it's a whole new world out there now, right? We're going to get Jackson's thoughts today on what he's seen from Mike McDonald so far, what he thinks he's building or trying to build and then we're going to dive deep into the draft. There's some wide receiver news today. What does that tell us about the value of that position and maybe the future of that position with the Seahawks? Some of the things he's seen on defense, his thoughts on the offensive line. And then does he have a Jackson Smith and Jigba in this year's draft? Remember his classic reaction to that pick last year. That was a guy that he had been pumping for months. He wanted that pick at 20, and when it happened, gave us one of the highlights of draft season. Does he have a JSN this year? He actually is going to give us three names of guys that he would stick and pick for at 16, as well as some other deeper thoughts on the draft. Jackson Bevins joins me next on Seahawks Forever. Welcome to the Seahawks Forever podcast. In-depth analysis on everything Seahawks. And now, here's your host, Dan Viennes. All right, here we go. Take care of some business first. If you prefer audio podcasts, you can subscribe wherever you listen to them. But if you want to hear episodes without ads, head over to Spotify. There's a link in the description of this show where you can subscribe to my show for less than a dollar a month at the moment, and you won't have to hear any ads. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button. That helps support the show and get this thing into the algorithm in an ideal manner. Also subscribe and hit that bell button. That way you don't miss any new episodes got a lot coming up this month as we are now just three and a half weeks away from mike mcdonald's first draft as head coach of the seahawks and then if you just want to support me or the show you can buy me a coffee or a beer that link will be down below as well uh let's not waste any more time let's get right into it this is a conversation i had earlier today with jackson bevins Joining me literally from a country club in Bellingham, Washington, uh, writer, host of Cigar Thoughts. You know him, you love him, Jackson Bevins. Thanks, thanks for uh, taking the time again out of your busy day to join me on the show. Oh, yeah, man. I, I've been looking forward to this. I know we had to reschedule a couple of times, so I'm <laughs> glad we made it happen. I always, always look forward to the chance to chat with you. I guess that's the the advantage of uh, of doing the show from a country club is you don't have to deal with uh, remodeling sounds. I think that's what knocked us uh, off our schedule a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, there might be might be a little bit of ambient noise here, but uh, I'm in my happy place. No, uh, it looks gorgeous. Uh, just stray golf balls, I guess, is all we have to worry about there, right? I'm I'm right next to a tee box, so hopefully uh, it it would have to be pretty stray. <laughs> so I'm not playing today, so I think you're safe. All right, fair enough. All right. <laughs> uh, let me do this. First of all, I, right before we started recording, I, I wanted to confirm the timeline that I kind of thought I had in my head just from my memories of reading your column, um, even before it was Cigar Thoughts, and then when you named it Cigar Thoughts. You have only known as a columnist and now a podcaster the Pete Carroll era of Seahawks football as far as analyzing, doing post games, breaking things down uh, that you do so well. What has this offseason been like for you with a new regime? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I'm i pretty excited. I think, you know, Pete, Pete Carroll is on my Seattle sports Mount Rushmore. I think he's the most important, most accomplished coach um, in our, our region's professional sports history. And I also think that we kind of have seen everything that we were going to see from Pete Carroll. High floor, no longer the highest ceiling. And um, I was surprised that they moved on. But as soon as they did, I really, really, really zeroed in on Mike McDonald. And uh, the fact that they waited and let everybody else hire all these other coaches while the Ravens kept winning uh, and then went and got their guy has me really excited. What have you been able to glean so far from just kind of everything you've you've heard them say and watched them do about sort of the direction they're heading and the identity that they're trying to build? I think Mike McDonald came in and saw a really undisciplined football team. Um, that That's what I'm picking up from him. You know, when you hear his former uh, associates and his former players talk about him, uh, they talk about how maniacally detail-oriented he is. And you see it. His teams tackle well. His teams don't miss assignments. Like, yes, they had some great players 
in Baltimore in these last couple of years. But when he took that defense over, they were like 25th in scoring. And at Michigan before that, when he took that defense over, they were like 117th in scoring. He got Michigan into the top 10, got Baltimore to number one. So that doesn't just happen from talent infusion. There was talent on those defenses, just like there's talent on the Seahawks defense. But they have been so discombobulated, so out of sync with each other. The tackling has been so poor. Uh, I think he's coming in and is not afraid to just lay waste to the whole thing and rebuild it in his image. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of one-year contracts in free agency uh, because he he's going to build it his way. And this is kind of a tryout year, I think, for everybody. It's interesting how quickly things have changed. I mean, obviously – you know, I think we, everyone would agree that the, the issue last year was on the defensive side of the ball, right? And and that the offense, even though it it was never all that consistent, you know, there were kind of stops and starts, that that was generally considered the better side of the ball, right? Now I, I get the sense that from from what I hear and see from the fan base, that the people are pretty jacked about what they did on defense. Bringing Leonard Williams back was a big first step. You know, signing those two linebackers that by all accounts, you know, there's a lot of positive things coming out about about how those guys might fit in. And, and they've added to their safety room, you know, kind of switched those guys out, brought the cornerback room and the edge group back intact. And and different than a year ago now up front anyway on defense, we feel a lot better about the depth there and, and some of the upside. On offense, though, there's a lot of people that are nervous about what's happening, and especially in the offensive front, right? And they they failed to bring back Damian Lewis. We don't know if that was a priority for them, really, or if he was going to fit into the new offense. They didn't make a big splash signing of any kind. They're bringing yet another veteran in today, uh, Greg Van Roten, a uh, 34-year-old journeyman. Are you nervous about what's going on up there, or do you believe Schneider and McDonald when they say, hey, there's some young guys that maybe the fans don't know about right now on this offensive line at the guard position that we feel better about than, than people are aware? Yeah, I'm totally nervous. I've been nervous about the interior of this offensive line for a decade. <laughs> they, and they haven't done anything to alleviate that concern. Um, I would have liked to have seen Damian Lewis back. I don't think I would have liked to have seen him back at 11 million a year, or 13 yeah. million a year, or whatever he was given. Like, I don't think that was an indictment of Damian Lewis, the player. I think that was an indictment of the contract that another team was willing to give him. Um, you know, I've been saying for basically the last calendar year. I don't care if they just use this entire draft to hammer interior offensive line and interior defensive line. Hmm. That'd be fine. They got seven picks. If they come out there with seven trench guys, I'm, I'm for it. Um, you wonder how much the George Fant signing speaks to Abe Lucas's uh, knee. Yeah. You know, they've been pretty cagey about that. I think, I think that's really the one thing that makes me nervous because even though the interior offensive line stunk for most of the last year in pass protection, when Abe Lucas came back, that offense was cooking. Yeah. And we were reminded why Geno Smith was considered such a good quarterback the year before. Here, here's the thing. Until Abe Lucas came back, which I think was the Cowboys game, and they went nuclear, uh, the pressure rate that Geno Smith faced was the same as the pressure rate that Seattle forced when they sacked the Giants quarterbacks 11 times. Wow. So think about that game. That, 11 yeah. sacks in a game. That was a 46% pressure rate. That is the pressure rate that Geno faced all season long. And I think still did admirably um, given that. So that has to be the number one thing that, that they address. And they just didn't have the money, especially if you want to keep Leonard Williams, they just didn't have the money to go give 11, 13, 15, $20 million a year to guards, to guards that, whose teams didn't want to keep them. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And, and I mean, we even knew you could tell Abe Lucas wasn't hundred percent when he came back. Like even, even yeah. I remember watching video of him running in practice the week before they activated him and thinking God, that guy can't play. Yeah. And he was still better than yes. anything else they could trot out there. And, and, and we still don't know. I mean, John Schneider says he'll be back week one, but we don't know. Uh, yeah. And, and so, you know, I'm with you. And as I do mock draft after mock draft, like I'm taking guards, right? Or I'm taking a tackle and moving them to guard, or I'm taking a tackle and moving. Look, I'm doing something to address that position. Yeah. But given some of Schneider's comments, 
about the value of guards and being able to get them later in the draft, do you think they will? Yeah. Yeah. I think that he doesn't want to pay guards that much money. And the way to avoid doing that is to draft them. And I think that's, I think that's what we're going to see. And it hurts to not have that second round pick and it hurts to not have, you know, the extra third round pick, because I think the cupboard could be fairly dry by the time you get to pick 81. But I imagine, especially with how many tackles are going to go in the first 50 picks of this draft, that that is pushing guard and center down to where I think you can get a player at 81 at that position that in previous drafts would have gone much sooner. So you see them doing kind of the Seahawk thing and going more premium defensive position in the first round. Is that where your gut is right now? I, there's three guys that I think I would be really happy with that. I, I, I'm pretty confident at least one of them will be there at 16 if they decide to stick and pick. And number one, top of the list, this is not groundbreaking, is Troy Fatanu out of yeah. UW. Yep, um, same. I, I think, like, look, he's not what Joe Alt is or uh, Fashanu or some of these other guys at the very top of the class. But like I'm one of those sickos that watched the combine drills for offensive linemen and dude, nobody, nobody there moved like Fatanu. There's nothing about the way that he moved, the way that he goes from zero step to first step, the way he goes from his first step through his fifth step. Nothing about that tells me he can't play guard and we already know he can play tackle. Oh, and by the way, his offensive coordinator and offensive line coach from college are on the team. So if they do select him, it's because, they're not guessing with him, and they have a plan. Uh, he's he's top of my board, but if Byron Murphy, uh, the defensive tackle from Texas, is there, or uh, Latu, the defensive end from UCLA, I'd smash except on either of those guys. Yeah. Which one's your JSN, though? Which which one of those guys is is it Fitzanu? Yeah. 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 Yeah, it is. It is. If um, anyone doesn't, I, uh, I don't have, I don't have a J, I don't have a JSN this year. You okay. you know how, how all in I was on, on him, yeah. how perfect of a fit I thought he'd be in Seattle. And I was thrilled to see them come through on that. Um, I was obsessed with JSN still yeah. am, still yeah. am. I, I think that he is an insanely talented wide receiver and his time is going to come. Um, at, at 16 this year, I mean, you know, I mean, if there's one player in that range I'm obsessed with, it's it's Quinion Mitchell, the cornerback, mm. uh, out of Toledo. But I don't think that they're going to go first round corner again. So um, if that if and and look, if he's the best player on their board, yeah, draft the best player, figure it out. Like I'm fine with that. But I I don't think that's the direction that they're going to go. It's funny as as I go back and forth and I try to consider all possibilities because you know we've we've seen a lifetime of the Seahawks throwing draft curveballs at us. That's that's the one I keep coming back to is is when you when you start to think about the runs that we're going to see in the first round and the and the, the strong position groups the quarterbacks are going to go first and then yep. those tackles are going to start to go and then at some point the receivers are going to start to go those oh, yeah. corners, which is a really good group those guys might start to get pushed down and so you start to think about you know we don't know how they feel about Reek Woolen we haven't heard Mike McDonald talk about him really mm -hmm. and you know a guy like Quinion Mitchell like. I, I see multiple pro comps out there from scouts, and the comp that I'm seeing the most is Devin Witherspoon. I know it. Really similar play style and attitude and everything else. And there's some other guys, too. I saw uh, Sean Michael Duger uh, mocked Cooper DeGene to the Seahawks today. Could totally see Mike McDonald loving that guy. Could see him being high on their board. And, and uh, yeah, that's one that I play around with. But I want to stay with the receivers. You brought it up. First of all, when you talk about JSN, New offensive coordinator, new philosophy, right? I think some people pigeonholed him as a slot only guy last year. Totally. Although, although totally. Waldron moved him around a little bit, but do you see him being more than that potentially? Yeah, uh, I I think the restructuring of Tyler Lockett was important from a real football standpoint. Like new new coach coming in, you already lost Bobby Wagner. Presumably, you've lost Quandre Diggs. Although I wouldn't be shocked to see them try and bring him back. Um, you know, you're, you're losing some real leaders in that locker room and yeah. Tyler Lockett is a leader in that locker room. And you got to have as a coach, especially as a new coach, I think you just got to have guys that you can trust to, to be that guy for the younger players and, and how to be a pro and all that stuff. And I think he's still good. I mean, I, I expect Tyler Lockett to have 800 yards next season. I also expect that it to be very apparent to all of us watching 
that Jackson Smith and Jigba is the second best receiver on this team by the end of the season. And I do think they're going to start moving him around. And to your point, which I think is a great one, bringing Ryan Grubb in, look, man, there is a lot of personnel overlap between the Seahawks offense and the Huskies offense, in my opinion. I think, you know, I've, I, I've mentioned this on my show, but, uh, you know, when Danny Kelly, we were chatting, he was putting together his, his draft guide, and we were talking about, you know, comps for, for Gino, and we were just texting back and forth, or for uh, Penix, and I, I said, Gino, he, yeah. he reminds me of if Gino Smith wasn't a knucklehead coming out of college. Um, I think that Adunze and DK Metcalf have a lot of skill set overlap. I think Polk and McMillan are very similar in a lot of ways to Jackson Smith and Jigba and Tyler Lockett, only mm-hmm. not as good. You know, I think Lockett and, and JSN are better than those guys. And now you've got Noah Fant in the Jack West over role. So the difference is you're not going to have the best offensive line yeah. in the game this year, but you do have two good tackles. Here's the key point. Ryan Grubb ran a three wide receiver offense. I think that Shane Waldron really, really struggled, especially when he wasn't getting any help from his offensive line, especially from the right tackle position. I think that he had a really difficult time figuring out how to get three wide receivers on the field that weren't just quick dump offs to Jackson Smith and Jigba, which is why we saw his average depth of target ranked near at or near the bottom of the entire league. Yeah. Um, that is not who he is. He's, he is not Rondale Moore and they used him like Rondale Moore last year. Hmm. Jackson Smith and Jigba can win at every level from both the Y and the Z position. I don't know that he'll ever be an NFL X, but I don't think he needs to be. Um, I think he's that perfect one step off of the line of scrimmage boundary receiver because he can do so much. He's so sudden. He's so good at the catch point and after the catch. Um, but Shane Waldron's best plays in 2022 were out of 12 and 13 personnel. Yeah. He was cooking with that. Yeah. And now all of a sudden it's like, well, you used the 20th overall pick on the consensus number one wide receiver from this class. Like, okay, better figure that out. Oh, and also you can't block on the edge. So you're going to be taking an extra tight end off the field when you've got subpar performance from your right tackle. Like he was in a bad spot. Ryan Grubb knows how to do this. It was three wide receivers mixing and matching all over the field. I think you're going to see more DK in the slot. I think mean, you're going to see Tyler Lockett in the slot. I think you're going to see JSN moved all over the place. I'm super excited about it. So let's uh, let's stay with the wide receivers because, y- you know, there's a conversation to be had today about the value of wide receivers and how that might be changing in the NFL. Lots of conversation this offseason among fans about potential trades, right? There's a, there's a school – there, there's a there's a click out there that wants us to trade DK Metcalf because they can get a first round pick for him. There's a local radio host that's been pounding the table for that all off season, right? There was this there was a fake rumor a couple of days ago that Tyler Lockett was potentially going to be traded for a fifth round pick, and fans lost their mind. They thought he was worth more than that. And then today we see a franchise wide receiver and Stephon Diggs traded for scraps. A a a few a cu- couple of seconds, right? Well, they, they got a future second. Right, they only got one second in in return. Is, oh, was it okay? Which, I thought it was two. So maybe not, maybe not scraps. I might be uh, that might be a little hyperbolic, but a future second, a twenty twenty five second, and they they had to throw in two other picks with digs to get that. What what does that tell you about the value of wide receivers? And and given all of that, and given the plethora of guys that come out every year now, seemingly that are ready to play in the NFL, which didn't used to be a thing. Wide receivers used to, it used to take some time for those guys that are you, it would surprise a lot of fans. A lot of fans would think it's a, it's a, it's an unneeded pick. Are you, are you expecting them to take a receiver in this draft at some point? Yeah, maybe late. Why yeah. not? Um, you know, I, I'm not like a big Bobo honk uh, necessarily, but I, I think he is a very good fourth wide receiver on your team. I, I would not personally, unless I was just in love with a dude, I, I would not be targeting wide receiver in this draft, even though this has the potential to be an all-time wide receiver draft. I mean, we could see seven in the first round. Um, I, I I think the benefit of this being a really strong quarterback class, at least a top-heavy quarterback class, the benefit of this being a really strong wide receiver class, the benefit of this being a really strong tackle class, is that it is going to push players down. I don't think this is something where Seattle needs to dip into those player pools necessarily. I think that they can take advantage of 
there's going to be player there. There will be a player available at 16 that would go in the top 10 of most drafts Mm -hmm. just because we are seeing so much early draft capital, at least projected to be siloed into these three positions, into quarterback, into tackle, into wide receiver. You can see four quarterback. You can see five quarterbacks and four wide receivers taken before Seattle picks. Yeah. Yeah, which only helps their their position. Field Yates tweeted today that he thinks teams in that 15 to 18 range are in a very advantageous position because of that. Because when you have the runs on those other positions, those receivers are going to start to drop and teams that are desperate for a playmaker are going to be looking at our range to, you know, to come up and and make a move. I mean, the John Schneider gift, baby. He's going to be cooking. Because at the end of the day, I mean, knowing that we don't have that second round pick, like you want him to trade down, right? Ideally. I don't want them to trade out of the tier of first round grades that they have. Um, And there are not, no team has 32 first round grades in any draft class ever but you have to give out 32 first round contracts. And I think that's a situation Seattle found themselves in trouble with in the past with guys like James Carpenter and LJ Collier and Rashad Penny, where, you know, you're, you're having to give first round uh, contracts to players that are, don't have first round grades. Um, I would guess that there's going to be three or four players that I would consider first round, borderline first round grades at positions Seattle will be targeting, um, still available at 16. I would not trade back to 28 with Buffalo unless it was like a big haul, like a second and a third this year and a second next year. Yeah, okay, then I'm maybe doing that. But other than that, I wanna make sure that I'm still getting a difference maker and a player that I have that kind of grade on. So I don't want to trade back just for the sake of trading back. And I think, and I know you don't believe this, but I think a lot of the discourse is just like, oh, just trade back, just trade back. Well, you got to have someone, you don't just trade back for fun. You got to still have a target at the spot you're trading back to, and the payment has to be worth it. So, but to Field Yates' point, to your point, yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of really hungry teams. You mentioned the digs trade, man. All of a sudden, Buffalo's got no receivers. They got no receivers, yeah. right? Gabe Davis gone. Stephon Diggs gone. They got Khalil Shakur and a couple of tight ends. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think 16 is going to look really tasty, but 16 to 28 is probably a pretty significant talent drop-off also, at least at the positions I think Seattle's going to want to target. It is, and that's probably about how far you have to go back based on the trade charts to get a second. And I think that's kind of the the, the blind spot that a lot of fans have is, is I hear it all the time, like, you know, just trade back and get a second, trade back and get a second. It's not that easy. You know, it's no, it like, is not. And, and even if the trade charts show that it is, you know, not all the teams use the same chart and, uh, and, and it's, you know, a pick is only worth what a team is willing to pay you for it. Right. Um, I, I do think it could fall a certain way. Um, and, and here's my here's my thought on this too, and I think we're we're fairly aligned on this. Because they don't have a second round pick, they can't miss on the first one. Like like that player has to be a foundational player, regardless of whatever position that they play. Um, That's right. When I look at this draft, and I've done a thousand mocks, I have a problem. <laughs> you, have, you do. You're a sicko, man. It's yeah, You're a and real it. D-gen. I love it. Yeah, and it, at least I admit it. Right. That's the first step in uh, overcoming a problem. They say. <laughs> It's. I don't know. I've never overcome a problem. So. <laughs> I don't I'm know. not willing. I'm. I'm. I'm not looking to overcome this one. Actually, I accept it. Um. But. But when I run different scenarios, and that's that's part of the addiction, is I just try to look at it from as many angles as possible. As opposed to, we got spoiled the last couple of years. We had extra picks, extra day two picks, and and they were, I think, a little deeper drafts. So it was easier to to fill out a seven round mock and see five six guys that that are going to contribute significantly as rookies when i do these scenarios now no matter how i work them out you know day day two and three are mostly like i'm i'm squinting to see the future you know and, and i'm looking at depth and i'm looking at guys on rookie contracts that will potentially outlive some of these short-term short term where's, where's your cutoff is it around like pick 50 unfortunately it's it's at about it's 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 before our third round pick <laughs> Yeah. I think, but but again, that's so that's that's the other thing, right? Like, oh, just get a second. Oh, just get a second. Like, yeah. I mean, if if that second is pick fifty eight from the Bills or pick sixty from the Bills or whatever, 
Like, is that a second round talent that you're drafting there? Right. Not, not in a normal year, you know? And, and so that's, that's why as much as I, this is what I struggle with as much as I, I'm like you, I love Fautanu. I love Graham Barton. You know, there's, there's some yeah, guys. I, love I like Barton too. Right. But, and, and you can still maybe get him if you move down in, in the, into the upper twenties, but interior offensive line might be the only position group that if I bypass it in the first round, I still feel like I'm getting a starter later on. Okay. That's good. That's which, good. I, I, why, I wasn't sure. Yeah. I wasn't sure about that. That's why I think that they'll probably go a different direction. But, but even that being said, I love Byron Murphy too. Huge Byron Murphy fan. They take him at 16 or 20 or 21 or whatever. He's a rotational player. Like he, he's, yeah. he's not going to, he's not going to be a full-time starter. That's not really the way that position works anyway. Um, and, and so I think fans need to be prepared for that. You know, I suggested a month ago that Byron Murphy would be an outstanding pick when I first started watching his film and falling in love with it. And anyone that doubts me, go watch the Alabama tape from this last year. He's getting double teamed and he's just, he's just stacking those guys. Yeah. It's just it, a guy came at me and said, why would you take a guy in the first round? that's not going to be a starter. I'm like, that's a, that's not how the defensive defensive line rotation works. B that's just not really how the draft works for the most part. Yeah. Um, but then it's yeah. like, why, why ever take a defensive lineman in the first round or a defensive tackle in the first round? Then you know yeah. what I mean. Like, Even the elite ones typically take time to develop. Guys like Quinn and Williams and Christian Wilkins. I mean, they, they took some time. Yep. You know, those guys didn't didn't pop as as rookies. Um, let's we can't not talk about quarterback, right? Of course. I know how you feel about Geno. You've touched on that today. Um, I've heard your thoughts on Sam Howell. I think I'm a little higher on him than you are, but. This the the Michael Penix talk just won't go away because of the connections, because of national speculation. Guys that do national mocks and things like that just keep Charles Davis had him going to us. Colin Coward has us trading up for him. Have you turned the page on that? Do you do you think that's that's kind of do you, do you think it's legitimate that it could happen? I love Michael Penix. <laughs> I love him so much. Um, I. Uh, I, I would make my peace with them taking him pretty quickly. Um, I, I think there's severe opportunity cost with taking a quarterback there. I, I think in most drafts though, Michael Penix is, would be a top three quarterback in or top four quarterback in, in most classes. Um, I think he's for sure the number four quarterback on the board last year. Uh, I think, what was it? The Kenny Pickett. Malik Willis year before that, I think, I think Penix is the first quarterback off the board in that draft. Um, he might've, you know, in hindsight, he, he maybe should have been taken before those guys even coming off four straight season ending injuries. <laughs> that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. So that, that's, the one thing, it. that's the one thing that I think there's going to be real um, concern about is, uh, is the injury, you know, yeah. two big shoulder injuries, two big knee injuries. Um, but that didn't affect his play. Last two years, he's been no, a and he's superstar. The national like that, game, he got the shit kicked out of him and kept coming back. Yeah, yeah. and you know it's funny. I was actually it's funny mentioning him twice, but uh, I was texting with Danny Kelly uh, this morning about Penix, and you know I I wonder that if they had lost that Texas game, if Adnan Mitchell had made that catch at the end of the game and Texas won, and that was the last that we had seen of Michael Penix. Was Ooh, him just perfect. touching touching yeah. the face of God for four hours? Yeah, um, I we might he might be a top ten pick. Yeah, and it yeah. could be it could be Atlanta. I mean, the butterfly effect is Atlanta not paying a hundred plus million dollars for Kirk Cousins and taking Michael Penix at eight. Yeah. Um, but then he went and got the shit kicked out of him in against Michigan, and that took some you know some of the petals fell off his rose in that game, but that Texas game is as good a single game tape as I've seen from a quarterback, certainly since Stroud against Georgia. And um, I don't know since then. <laughs> Deshaun Watson against Alabama in, yeah. in the title game, maybe is the last time that I saw uh, a game with stakes that high a quarterback play as well as Michael Penix did in that game. So, um, but the opportunity cost is there. I'm not worried about him being an older prospect because he killed it when he was younger. Um, it's not like it took him until he was 23 years old to be good. He was good at 22. Um, yeah. 
so and an age at quarterback isn't as big of a deal. If you're if you're good, you can play quarterback in the NFL. You can start quarterback in the NFL. Well and truth is there are so many good 30 year old starting quarterbacks in this league right now. Uh, you know, cousins and Stafford and Rogers and Chino. I mean Well, and if you're ready to play right away, I mean there's you know McCarthy and May are, are much younger and that might be appealing to some teams, but but the consensus is also that they probably shouldn't play right away. So yeah. You know, and, and I don't and I don't know that like I think Penix steps in tomorrow and gives you a better chance of winning a football game than JJ McCarthy does, but I totally understand saying, okay, but in two years, right? Like yeah. you you can project onto a guy like JJ McCarthy or Drake May more than you can onto Penix. Penix feels like a known commodity. Um, and I think that known commodity is good. I will say yeah. one thing though. I think that I think that circumstance and environment matters so much for any position, but especially for quarterback. Oh, and yeah. you know, Caleb Williams will be the best quarterback out of this draft class, and the second best quarterback is going to be whoever Minnesota drafts. Yeah, I agree. I yeah, don't care who it is. It's looking more and more like McCarthy, and unless May falls, and that's kind of the buzz right now too. So mm-hmm. um, you touch on some really cool things, and and, and you wonder. You talk about that, you know, the difference between what you see and and what you project, and that can be exciting, but that gets a lot of GMs fired too. You know, I think Bo Nix is kind of suffering from that a little bit right now too. I mean, you kind of know who he is. He might have a higher floor than some of these other guys. Doesn't have as high a ceiling. But you can probably plug him in and, and win with him right away if the supporting cast is decent. But because he doesn't, he's not dripping with that kind of upside that you can dream on. Then he starts to fall. Right. And I think that's where scouts get in trouble. I think that's where GMs get in trouble. Yeah. It's, well, and it's fascinating. The thing is, is like millionaires whose jobs literally rely on getting the quarterback pick right, get the quarterback pick wrong all the time. I mean, we just don't know shit. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, at the same time, everyone on Twitter knows exactly who's going to be right. good and who that's isn't right. good. And yeah. they will fight you. There are people that will fight me that Spencer Rattler is going to be an all pro. And then all these other guys uh, are are overrated. So I mean, it, it could happen. What what happens if the Rams take Spencer Rattler in the third round? <laughs> yeah, and he sits behind Stafford for a year and then takes over a Sean McVay offense. Like it could happen. It it depends on where these guys land. Yeah, absolutely. It's I think it's one of the the most interesting storylines of the draft, and and maybe part of that's because we're here and we've we've seen Penix's you know story arc. And right. just, you know, I, I'm with you. I think you word it in an interesting way that you'd make peace with it. There are picks that I would immediately react to and, in, in, you know, with excitement, you know, kind of the way you did with JSN last year. And then there's <laughs> just a the touch there's, of excitement. Right. And then there's picks where I would go, you know, kind of the Rashad Penny pick where I'd go, well, that doesn't seem to make sense. And I'd have to right. dig in and research it and try to understand it. And then there's those where it, it might not hit me right away. But it would hit me pretty quick. And I think Penix is one of those who would be like, God, I wish, you know, that seems like a luxury, right? But as I've made the case on my show, you're you're kind of layering that position now. You're 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 doubling down on on the chances of finding a guy, which is so hard to do, especially when you're in that middle of the pack, that okay, we maybe we should have seen it all along. Grub, huff, we overthought it, you know, and there it well, is. Totally. And I'm I'm operating from the perspective where I believe Michael Penix is going to go in the first round. It is now Vegas odds for the over under on four and a half quarterbacks. The over is prohibitive. You have to, I think there, I think it was minus 220 this morning. So the the strong feeling right now, three weeks out is that there's going to be at least five quarterbacks taken in the first round. And I can't imagine Penix not being one of those five. Well, I can imagine it, but I would be surprised if he's not one of those five. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating. It's going to be a lot of fun because there's so much we don't know, and that just adds to the intrigue, right? Big time. Big time, man. This is a very exciting time to be a Seahawks fan, I think. It is indeed. Uh, Always great to have you on the show. I know you got things to do, but I appreciate you taking time to hop on, and uh, we'll definitely get back together again after the draft, and we'll we'll hash all this out. We'll see where we were right and where we were wrong and what we know and what we don't know, as always. Perfect. Dan, I always love talking ball with you, man. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Take care, man. All right. Later. Always fun talking to Jackson. Be sure to check out his column on Field Goals, Cigar Thoughts, and also his uh, podcast. You can find that on YouTube. 
Absolutely. You have some fantastic guests on there. Uh, as far as this show, got some cool stuff coming up. Some great guests the rest of the month and uh, a lot more mock drafts. If you want to watch the latest mock draft mania that I posted, Michael Thompson, 12th Man Rising, and I did a dueling mock draft where one of us takes Penix and one of us doesn't. You get to compare and contrast and, and vote on which one you prefer. And then we did a, a combo draft live during the show uh, where we alternate picks. And uh, so take a look at that one. Uh, I'll link that down below as well. And uh, then you can weigh in on which one you like the best. Until next time, forever and always, go Hawks. I am Dan. Follow me on Twitter at Seahawks Forever. We'll see you soon.